Okay, my friends, it's day 309 in Ukraine, in Putin's awful invasion of Ukraine. Uh, today, I want to talk about a number of things, and there's no one coherent theme, and I've been watching other YouTubers, uh, and I stole this idea from a Canadian dude, which was, I think, formerly a Russian dude. Uh, he has um, he puts the chapters up ahead of time, so that's what I'm going to do here. Tell me, tell me what you think of this. Is this a positive innovation? So we're going to talk about 120 missiles that rain down in Ukraine today. We'll talk about how they hit Engels Air Base. Like, how are they able to get that technology through? We'll talk about Ukrainians pushing back on the Russian front. And they've made a lot of progress. And I'll tell you how. And I'll show you some pretty amazing things with that. We'll talk about soft propaganda and pre-bunking. And then we'll also talk about fun with Russian state media. And then finally, last but not least, I'll reveal the best joke that I've gotten from you, the viewers. So 120 missiles rained down on Ukraine today, and that is absolutely terrible. Now, uh, I saw this headline and I thought, okay, so I don't know much about the Daily Mail. If you're a British, you can tell me whether it's like a tabloid or what. But generally, most newspapers don't start with smug Putin poses in his office, which he might be smug and he might pose in his office. And that's all well and good. But generally they're try they try to be more balanced just but the the facts are what's interesting and the pictures are what's even more interesting just hours after pummeling ukraine with 120 missiles in biggest onslaught for weeks now we're going to talk about why that's the biggest onslaught for weeks that's part of it but before we talk about that let's look at the pictures so you see putin talking in his office delivering his whatever speech about ships or something. And then this is the aftermath of what's actually going on on the ground in Ukraine because of what he has actually chosen to do. So it's quite a contrast to to start with. Okay, let's talk more about the missiles and the strikes and things along those lines. This is what it actually sounds like when missiles are striking. Uh, this is also from The Guardian. Hundred twenty missiles. Okay, so now you can understand if you hear missiles striking in the distance, why in Ukraine they're not going to be celebrating uh, New Year's Eve with fireworks. I've wondered this for years. Like, if a soldier has PTSD, if he's like, you know, <laughs> a little freaked out by fireworks, because that's, I mean, it can't be pleasant to have those kind of flashback memories. And he said, pyrotechnics today is not about celebrating, it's a reminder of explosions. It's already psychologically difficult for millions of people in Ukraine to survive the war. Therefore, I urge you to think about these citizens and do not uh, uh and do without pyrotechnics we will set the fireworks off at, together after the victory i think that's a, actually a really good balanced approach you want don't want to have people living in fear thinking there's another attack okay let me switch gears and talk about topic two um now we we're talking about like how are these missiles getting through to hit engels air base and other places within russia and uh the uh, Tipling philosopher actually talked about this yesterday. He uh, he and I are probably going to be doing a collaboration in a few days um, just to talk about some things that we hold mutually uh, of mutual interest regarding Ukraine. And uh, I, I was watching this and I thought, yeah, you know, there's something to this. I can't give this 100% authentication. It's not like I can say, yes, this is from a definitive news article, but he makes sense. So let's That's listen. Red. One of the points is that you need these radar systems 50 kilometers apart in order to give, you know, decent coverage. But the, the one theory is, or and there's good evidence that this has happened, is that the Russians have removed a whole load of their radar systems from Russia to put them into the occupied territories of Ukraine to help them fight their battles um, and and defend their occupied territories and the troops and the installations they have um, in, in their territory. So they, they've taken these radar defense systems and surface-to-air missiles perhaps as well uh, and take them out of the, the Russian main kind of, you know, country, the Russian or blasts up here so it could be that actually there is quite an easy flight path for the ukrainian drones to hit the engels airfield in saratov because they've removed a load of radars and so actually if if ukraine know where the russian radars remain then they can easily evade those made radars with a little bit of steering here and there and then bob's your uncle 
uh, Engels can get hit. And it's only when the drones get sort of when it's too late, when they get near to Saratov and above above the airbase, that you know the Russians claim they hit the the drone above the airbase. Uh, but of course, that's incredibly unrealistic. Yeah. That every time they right. take these drones out, yeah, the the idea that they hit the drone and three people died from falling debris, uh, I don't think that that's probably true. But I, I don't know. I'm not there, but I doubt it. And so this leads us to another really interesting question. Why did the missile strike, why was there such a long pause between the previous missile strike and this missile strike? Are they running out of missiles? Well, yes, they are depleting their missiles. But uh, someone, I think it was Jake Bro, it might have been Canadian, dude, I don't remember. One of them said <laughs> that they hit the headquarters building. I mean, that's what they struck with the drone. Like, so they couldn't actually coordinate those planes to go strike. So they gave themselves an extra week by doing that. And that's pretty impressive if that's what in fact happened. Okay, let's look at this. As a result of the missiles fire, Herzan's regional cardiological dispensary was damaged. Two people were injured and medical field uh, facilities were shelled regularly. Now, in, in part of me says, okay, 120 missiles, you probably can't help but hit this, but this isn't a bug. This is a feature of the way that the Russians conduct their warfare. They're happy to hit a maternity hospital or whatever else, because that's part of grinding down the population. Okay, next, Ukrainian soldiers advanced 2.5 kilometers toward Kremina over the week, says the AFU general staff. Now, what does that mean to an American? Uh, that's 1.5 miles. So that's actually a pretty reasonable amount of ground to take in a very short period of time and just over the last week. And when they get to Kremina, they cut off a major supply route and they're doing a really good job. According to the um, AFU, you see that there's a total losses of Russian invaders amount to about 104,560 people that's killed. Now, I'm in no position to say that that's true or untrue. I'm reporting what's here. The American and the British estimate is smaller, but they're not on the ground. So I don't know what's there. 790 were killed over the past day, they claim. So that is quite a number. Now, you couple that with what's coming next here. And if you put that together, it kind of paints a... The story kind of sounds true when you follow this. So Ukraine, mili uh, U.S. military expert John Spencer, Ukraine's position on the battlefield is very strong. Now, I've interviewed Spencer. He is a he's a brilliant guy when it comes to urban warfare. Uh, John Spencer is a retired U.S. U.S. Ma Army major, expert on urban warfare. Currently serves as the chair of urban warfare studies at Madison Policy Forum. He's also, um, you know, been a consultant to generals about urban warfare. Like he's like the guy. Spencer is also the author of the mini manual for the Urban Defender, and his mini manual is used on the ground by Ukrainian troops, and it's pretty impressive. Spencer says that President Putin is unlikely to end the Russian invasion of Ukraine anytime soon, but he predicts that Ukraine will ultimately prevail. OK, I do not share the opinion of the people who think that this war will last for years. Ukraine's position on the battlefield is very strong, Spencer says. That's that's really good to know. Uh, and it has equally strong allies off the battlefield in all this peripheral stuff, economically and politically and in the information space. Uh, Putin is not going to let his own intentions go. He doesn't care how many Russian soldiers will die, but the Russian army is in trouble, very big trouble. Putin wants to slow down the war. He needs time to give at least a little military training to the thousands of people who are forced into the military service. At this point, I don't see any direction in which the Russian army can advance. And he goes on and talks about other stuff. And you can read the article if you want. But wow, that's that's actually a really powerful assessment. Again, I interviewed Spencer, and here's just a little bit of that interview. Put yourself in a place of, don't worry about which city, uh, but just a, an, an urban environment, a city that's under Russian attack. You know that the city is starting to be surrounded. What do you do? Take it, take it from here. So if I was in, in a city in anywhere in the world, and, it, and somebody is heading my way, a, a, a really big, bad enemy force, the first thing that I would do is organize civilians into small groups. Right. War is not an individual act, no matter what. It's not Rambo off by himself. So I'm going to stop there. You can watch the interview. It's posted. In fact, I'll put the link down below so that you can watch that interview. But he's, he's just a wealth of knowledge. Okay, let me keep going. So let me switch gears. And I'm going to show you a little bit of Anna from Ukraine. I was talking about lies yesterday. I was talking about how Russia lies and, and this guy lies and that guy lies and the other guy lies. Here, she had a very profound little bit about 
Russian soft propaganda. And I want you to listen to her and see everything else that we say from this point forward in the framework of that. Western version. Honestly, I think we have to confess that in one of the spheres, Russia is still one of the best armies in the world. And that is in the sphere of informational war. That's right. At the very beginning of recent Russian-Ukrainian war in 2014, when they annexed our Crimea and took the territories of Donetsk and Luhansk regions, it was very difficult to demonstrate Ukrainians' vision of uh, this war, of this invasion. And many world media tried like to avoid this topic or described it the way Russians wanted or in that neutral way. Of course, that was a problem because Russia was and still present in every country of the world, perhaps, and they broadcast their messages in more than 100 different languages of the world. They spend much money on that. The propaganda budget of Russia is uh, billions of dollars, and I think they spend more than any other authoritarian regime on the information they want to give to the world and, of course, inside Russia, too. Okay, so that's why we spend all this time with fun with Russian propaganda. That's why we spend this time do going over that segment because I'm showing you what they're showing other places. But you know, while Putin was a master at informational warfare and and Russia was doing you know epic work with this, he didn't count on Zelensky. And Zelensky's media savvy has been one of his saving graces that he understood what he was up against and was able to counter that. Now, countering that means debunking, but it also means pre-bunking. This is the GCHQ chief. It's kind of a department within British intelligence talking about what pre-bunking means. Western spy agencies should use intelligence to pre-bunk narratives pushed by Russia and other authoritarian states. That is, that they should get out in front of the message before they have a chance to do anything. You talked about in this war, the sea change that we've seen during this conflict of getting the intelligence out there and using it to pre-bunk. That is, that they were saying things like, hey, look, Russia's about to do this, and they're going to say it's because of that. In the run-up to the war, Western agencies issued a series of public warnings, first generally that Russia planned a, quote, multi-front invasion of Ukraine, and later that there were a very specific pro-Russian coup plot, right? And they talked about that. And, and I remember watching this in the news and thinking like, okay, well, certainly Putin's not going to do it now. Well, who, who knew what was going to happen there? Haynes, Haynes is the head of the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, Haynes argued a relatively novel approach for the normal, the normative or normally secretive spy agencies, quote, we saw that they were looking to create a pretext for the invasion, which they were, they were making stuff up and then using that soft propaganda and spreading it through their media outlets. And we wanted to sort of debunk that and help people understand that this was a false narrative, she said. But Haynes acknowledged our impact was far greater in the West than it was in other places in the world. In Russia, we had basically no impact, she said, and we were not that impactful in other countries that had already sort of taken the narrative of what Russians were pushing. And they have, and you just, it's palpable in some other places. And But this is where really you come in. Because you're part of this debunking and pre-bunking effort. I, I don't know what we should call you all, like Merrill's Marauders has been taken and other cool names, but give yourself a name of what, what your job, because you are some of the most well-informed people on this planet about this. Most of you that watch this, these videos that I put out, you're already watching a half dozen. You understand this. So you're part of the solution in the information war space. Okay, uh, now it's time for some fun with Russian state media. So the first article is this. Belarus shoots down a Ukrainian missile, says the Ministry of Defense of Belarus. The projectile fired by an S-300 air defense system was intercepted in midair, the defense ministry said. According to the Belarusian Ministry of Defense, parts of the missile fell on agricultural land near the village of Gorbanka. Okay, so the Russians would absolutely love to have a pretext for Belarus to have to enter the war. But look how they kind of twist this in here. Um, the incident comes as officials in Minsk accuse Kiev of masking troops and setting up firing positions across the border. So, you know, Kiev's government is trying to start a war. Remember, after all, on November 15th, a falling missile killed two people in eastern Poland. And Kiev initially accused Moscow of attacking Polish territory. So we can't really trust those that, that evil regime in Kiev. So that's how they're going to spin that. 
Okay, uh, Pravda was a little bit more balanced in RT. It's believed that the rocket may have landed on the territory of Belarus accidentally, as happened earlier in Poland. It could be shot down by air defense systems of Belarus. Okay, but the Russians would love to have this as a pretext to draw the Belarus into the war. Uh, Ukrainian fighters complained too little of mortars and too much mud. Now, this guy gave a the commander of the 48th Rifle Battalion of the 72nd Motorized Rifle Brigade of the Armed Forces of Ukraine gave an interview with the Times, and he said, quote, the ratio of mortars is one to seven in favor of the Russians. Okay, but now they're making this look like, well, you know, that just show, goes to show you that they don't have stuff. And that, like we have seven times their their capacity. Well, you were also shelling them at 10 times the rate in uh, uh, Severodonetsk and Lusachansk, but that doesn't mean that their morale isn't sky high or that they're somehow losing uh, or that you're not gaining any ground and, and sending your people into a meat grinder in Bakhmut. Okay. Um, Moscow is outraged by the crackdown on Russian media abroad. This was absolutely amazing. Sometimes, most of the time, actually, what you see in Russian state mirror is a uh, Russian state mirror. That was a Freudian slip. Russian state media is a mirror of whatever they're doing. They project on others. So France is pushed to ban Russian news outlets, both on a nation's territory and the EU is unacceptable. Moscow's foreign ministry spokeswoman, Maria Zakharova said on Thursday, well, they ban Google, they ban uh, uh, YouTube, they ban American and Western media from going into Russia. So what do you have to complain about? Moscow is outraged by the new steps taken by Paris aimed at introducing more and more broadcasting bans on Russian media. It's such a display of Russophobia. Okay. Every time, so there's a couple of things here. One, I don't support that ban. I think you should have access to RT so you can see this and see what they're doing. So, and that's why I'm I'm showing you this here, but I'm showing you this in context and trying to make sense out of it. But here, here's what I've learned from watching and reading a lot of Russian state media. They're constantly putting themselves in a position where they can be the victim. Oh, it's the Russophobia of oh, the West NATO. They're trying to kill us. They hate us. Oh, it's so bad. If, if only they would be nice and come to the peace table, right? While they're destroying and killing and raping their neighbor. Okay. Um, another article, Lavrov blasts Zelensky's illusions. Russia is not about to engage with Ukraine based on the peace formula put forward by President Vladimir Zelensky as a deep Deems unacceptable. Okay, so it deems it unacceptable because it's not going to give up those oblasts that you have illegally annexed. By putting forward all sorts of ideas and peace formulas, Zelensky cherishes an illusion that with the help of the West, he will be able to achieve the withdrawal of our troops from the Russian territory of the Donbas, Crimea, Zafirite region, Herzan regions, the payment of reparations by Russia, and that would give itself up to the international tribunals, etc. Moscow will not talk to anyone under such conditions. Okay, so you're not going to talk to anyone under such conditions. So it'll be decided on the battlefield, and then you'll have the tribunals. I mean, and the reparations that follow. That's the way it'll work because you're not willing to uh, have any actual meaningful peace talks. You're not willing to have peace talks either. So let's just be honest. Okay, so that's all that I have for today. So before I get to the final joke, let me also add, um, please, if you want to um, support, you know, uh, what's going on in Ukraine, you can support Samaritan's Purse. I have a link to um, a businessman that uh, is selling, you know, stuff online that you know, t-shirts and hats and mugs. And if you want to support them through that, please feel free to click on those links. But here we are with the final thing, the joke of the day, and that is this. I asked about, you know, what jokes um, you guys, uh, you know, your, your best jokes about Ukraine. This one, uh, this resonated with me. How do Ukraine, Ukrainians keep accurately hitting angles? They use marks. Okay. So as a professor, I just found that hilarious. Like the wordplay, uh, let alone that the nerdy academic reference, I just thought that was great. So um, why Ukraine, uh, you you are the best. That That was awesome. All right. Thank you for your time. And I will see you again tomorrow.